Good morning, my friends. This is another edition of the Cast Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com as well as St. Alexis Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Also brought to you by Two Ways Food Truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Kind of stuff we're going to get into today, and I do want to recap a little bit of the show that we did last week because for the first time in a long time, we actually got a little bit of a response, and it probably took me getting a little bit upset or animated to get a point out there that I actually appreciate the fact that a lot of people aren't aware of. And obviously the varying degrees of the reaction to it, whether it's people that are still in denial, thinking that the way that it has been kind of permeated and penetrated into their head for many, many years is the exact way that things are and they, they see exactly what it is that they think they see. Managers in Major League Baseball have really been castrated. They've had the impact that they have on a game, the decisions that we all think and have thought for years that they're making taken away from them. And it's almost in like kind of an insulting way. It almost insults some people's intelligence. And I do appreciate the dialogue we've had talking about this. I think it's something good to open with, but to talk only a couple minutes about. There's a couple other important topics I want to bring up today. Um, we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about ironic sports names, and there's a little bit of a tie-in to that, which we'll discuss. Uh, whether sometimes when you look at championship teams in sports, the turning point is a star moving on or getting rid of a star as opposed to adding a star. There's examples of both in sports. I think it's going to be certainly important to talk about. And I do believe that there's another thing that we are overlooking in baseball where we kind of make assumptions that a game is as good as this. And I'll kind of tease it before we get into it in a little bit. But to kind of recap the whole and just kind of put a bow on it, finish it, end it. End the discussion finally. Baseball managers, if you don't know by now, have very little impact on a game of baseball. They, they're there as a guidance counselor. They're there to command and get the respect of the players that are playing there for them or with them. It's very important a manager loses the locker room. It's no different than it was in 1940 or 1980 or 2000, whatever year you want to take it back to. If a manager isn't getting respect from the players, the players aren't coming to work every day fire it up and wanting to win and wanting to do things and succeed for the manager, then there's a problem. That's the same problem that existed any year or any time. But the problems that we like to assume is say, hey, you know, manager A set the lineup up a certain way and because of that, they he, he screwed the team or he messed up the whole game or gave the team a little chance to win because of the decision that he made in the lineup. And I'll use the Mets as an example. And understand this. If I use the Mets, it applies to every baseball team. So if I say Mickey Calloway, if you're a Phillies fan, think of Gabe Kapler. If you're a Yankees fan, think of Aaron Boone. If you're a Cincinnati Reds fan, think of David Bell. If you're a San Diego Padres fan, think of Andy Green. If you're a St. Louis Cardinals fan, think of Mike Schilt. Use whatever position I'm talking about and understand that it applies to every single team. So Mickey Calloway is the manager of the Mets. Brody Van Wagenen is the general manager of the Mets. And the best way to describe this is going back for years upon years, where the general manager was in charge of putting together a baseball team, and the manager was in charge of the players that were on the field. So the, the ability to put the team together, the roster construction, was the responsibility of the general manager, and the manager's job was to take those players and utilize them to the best of his ability. And we've understood that, stood that there's kind of a liaison now, a, a, uh, a longer extension, which is kind of unified one part to the other, kind of putting them together. The general manager and the manager are connected by different aspects and facets of a Major League Baseball team's front office. And what that does is it kind of brings everybody into the same room, everybody sharing the same group of ideas. So this is in, once again, if you're talking about Brody Man Wagonin or if you're talking about the Phillies and Mike Klentak or the Yankees and Brian Cashman, you know, it's, it's not a 
idea that's not commonly shared. In other words, they're all in on the same decisions that are made. The lineups that are put together, yes, you could blame Mickey Callaway, but Mickey Callaway is not doing anything that Brody Van Wagenen doesn't want done, or Jared Banner, the, the you know the uh, you know charge of analytics with the Mets, or whether it's Jim Ringelman, the bench coach, or Omar Minaya in the front office. They're all together with the same ideas and the same game plans. If you listen to Terry Collins talk after he you know, ended up moving on from being the manager of the New York Mets, works in the Mets front office, understands how much the game has changed. It used to be, you know, Terry Collins talked about when he was the manager of the Astros or the Angels, and he had to show up about five, six hours before, you know, the players would even get there and come up with a game plan and analyze with himself and his coaches what players should play, what players shouldn't play, if there should be any adjustments made, how are you going to go through the bullpen today if the starter didn't go a certain amount of time. Now a manager shows up two hours before the game starts and there is a game plan there, a series of four or five different sheets that are telling the manager exactly what it is to do. And it's amazing how many people are good baseball fans, how many people follow the game and just don't understand this. You know, like I said, I'm not going to raise my voice about it anymore because I made my points last week. There's still a lot of people that don't understand. There's still a lot of people that think, for whatever reason, that the manager is the one deciding who plays a certain day, decides which players are going to be given a scheduled day off. The scheduled day off should be the easiest thing to understand. As we hit the opening point here at the Pass Ball Show, JohnPielli.com, two, two ways Food Truck, St. Aloysius Church and School, Jackson, New Jersey. Castro Motor Oil, Budweiser, the king of beers. But that should be the first thing that we figure out and understand. That's the obvious part of it. And then as you move on and you think of from scheduled days off, which we know are made by the manager, we still want to blame the manager, and different lineup decisions. Hey, why is this guy playing against the lefty or this guy playing against the righty? You know, uh so-and-so has been doing so well, he's out of the lineup today. We just got to stop blaming the managers for it. Blame more of the collective effort. And, I'm not, and I know we're so used to, in society, when it comes to sports, to blame an individual. We want to blame one person for the reason why this team's lineup looks like crap today or this guy's playing over another player, and it, we're so used to blaming a manager. It's time to blame the collective effort that's put with the Mets Mickey Callaway is just as responsible as Brody Van Wagenen, is just as responsible as Jared Banner, just as responsible as Alard Baird, Omar Minaya, Jim Riggleman, Dave Island, and there's so many other people that are involved in making those individual decisions about the roster, about the lineup, about the pitching, you know, what relievers you're going to go to in certain innings. Now, obviously, each game can happen uniquely and differently. You can't plan. This isn't spring training to say, hey, X pitcher is going to start, these five pitchers are going to relieve because you don't know how the starting pitcher is going to pitch. You don't know how your offense is going to show up. Are you going to be able to touch the other pitcher? Are you going to get off to a big lead? Are you going to be down by a lot of runs? What's the matchup in the sixth inning as opposed to the seventh inning or the eighth inning? So there's some things that are still a little objective, and I think there's some decisions that are made within the game that I think we still can blame the manager for. But at the same time, I'm still not 100% convinced that the manager in the Major League Baseball dugout is making those in-game decisions, or at least making all of them. He might be making some of them, but he's got input. He's got that bench coach there. And let's understand another thing about baseball really over the last 20, 25, 30 years, the use of the bench coach, the right-hand man that exists in Major League Baseball, the manager's assistant, is something that they didn't always have. They had a series of coaches, hitting coaches, pitching coaches, defensive coaches, obviously third base and, and, and first base coaches. But now you're seeing the use of that second manager, the manager's assistant, and he's taking a lot of the responsibilities of the manager, or at least is having a very good voice into the ear of the manager. And when we want to go out there and blame, like I said, the manager for everything, and I may come out as the biggest Major League Baseball manager apologist, which is fine. If that's what I'm going to be defined as, I'm okay with it. It's not really what I want. It's not what I'm seeking. 
But I'm just seeking truth. I think we should have transparency in the world and sports as we understand exactly what's going on. It all understand the same thing. But we know. We continue to want to blame the manager. Hey, you know, so-and-so makes an error. What's he doing in a game? The manager put him in a game. No, maybe the general manager did. Maybe a special assistant to the general manager did. Maybe the director of analytics with their spray charts decided that they were in there. But if you can infuse all these different stats and say, hey, this is the new age of baseball, why are we not growing up? And understanding with the new age of baseball is the castration of the Major League Baseball manager as we know it right before our own eyes. Because we're failing to look at it like that. And I think it's very ignorant. I think it's very silly. I look at people that will make the statement, hey, the manager did this and the manager did that. I'm sorry. I look at you like you are, you are lacking the baseball acumen at the moment. Now, hopefully... Somebody could teach you along the way. You know, like when you learn how to get on a bike and, you know, a couple years later you want to get on a more complex bike, one that has a little bit more, you know, stronger parts and different features, and you have to make the adjustment to get on that different bike. That's what you got to do. Major League Baseball managers are not going to have that accountability that you're throwing out there when you're blaming them for stuff. And it's like somebody else knocking over that cookie jar on the floor. And just because you're there, you get blamed for it, even though you know exactly who it is that did it. When it comes to Mickey Calloway, when it comes to Aaron Boone, when it comes to Gabe Kapler, Alex Cora, any other major league manager, do you want to throw out there and say, hey, here's, here's the issue. Why did this happen? That manager probably knows who influenced them with that particular decision. But they're not going to go in front of the microphone like this and say, I didn't do it. At least while they're still managing that ball club. And I hope we all understand that. This copyright and broadcast is authorized under internet rights granted by the World Wide Web and is solely for entertainment of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of the show without the express written consent of the past ball show, JohnPLA.com, and JohnPLA LLC is prohibited. Any commercial other use of programs such as by charge and admission for its showing is similarly prohibited. I had to throw that disclaimer in there because I do have a couple other things I got to bring up in, in regards to some of the sponsors, Two Ways Food Truck We're out of Scranton, Pennsylvania. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I wanted to finish off my baseball point and kind of adding or piggybacking off of talking about how analytics have changed the game but yet certain perceptions remain the same. The same perception you have about a Major League Baseball manager has not changed, even though the analytics dictate that it has changed. The other thing that we go for all the time, and I always, I always laugh when I hear this, so-and-so is pitching tonight for my team. So it's either a good thing or a bad thing. Either that pitcher is really good, and you have a really good chance of winning that individual game, or that pitcher sucks, has a bad track record, and there's no chance that that team's going to win the game. And I could use a guy like Jason Vargas for the Mets, but for the Yankees, I could use a day where they decide to go to the bullpen or the opener. Let's say Chad Green is starting a game for the Yankees. You know he's only going to go an inning or two. The Phillies obviously have some issues with their starting rotation. Uh, let's say you know Vince Velasquez is going to make a spot start or... They call up somebody from the minor leagues, and before the game even starts, you want to say, hey, there's no chance you're going to win that game. Look at who is starting. Look at who is pitching that day, as opposed to Jacob DeGrom or you know Masahiro Tanaka or Aaron Nola or Max Scherzer or Clayton Kershaw or Chris Sale taking a ball for your given team. It's somebody that's not up on that level, and you just assume that there's no chance you're going to win that game. Now, if this was 1972 or 1980, when you knew that that elite starting pitcher was going to go eight, nine innings and there was nobody else going to be involved in the game, and that opponent was probably going to be forced with a lousy arm or a lousy set of skills or a track record that leaves something to be desired, may push himself through six innings, giving that other team the opportunity to score five or six or seven runs. The game has changed. So that starting pitcher that may not have the skills of an elite pitcher could do a good job and go four innings. 
could hold the team down a little bit. And if you have a good bullpen, or if you have a good piggyback pitcher, somebody that's going to be that next pitcher to come in there, you have just as much of a chance to win a game in 2019 as if you had an ace pitcher out there. And that's what we're talking about is it's happening right before our eyes. We're watching the manager position change, and we understand that the manager position in baseball just doesn't have the same responsibilities. It's a guidance council. That person's there to control the clubhouse, make sure the players want to run through a wall for that guy, want to you know win this so bad are on the side of the manager, but most importantly are on each other's side and helping and supporting each other. That's the manager's responsibility. But we're also seeing a change in regards to the starting pitcher in Major League Baseball. He's really becoming the first pitcher, the first pitcher that's going to come in a game. And we watch this. Tampa Bay has done a very good job with Ryan Stanek and the opener. Other teams have kind of followed suit. Some have had some success, some haven't. But that first pitcher coming in there pitching, to the first three to five batters, and maybe that second inning. And you go to another pitcher who's going to get you through a certain time in a game and then get you into your first guy in the bullpen, your second guy in the bullpen, your closer, and that's how you win a game. Tampa Bay Rays have proven you can win baseball games like that. Other teams are following suit, but there's different variations of it. So it's not all about the starting pitcher who's pitching on a given day. Who cares? If some AAA minor league pitcher that's only going to get a couple starts in the major leagues and never play in the big leagues again is starting today. Because you may only need him to go three innings. Go through the lineup a time or two. And then get into your middlemen and your bullpen. And if you score enough runs, you'll have a chance to win that game. The same amount of opportunity you'd have to win that game as if you would, as if you had your ace out there. So it's another thing that I think Modern day baseball fans, as we're looking at ourselves, throwing all these different numbers at you, look at me. Uh, you know, we can rate defense, we can rate this, we can rate that, we can throw all these different stats that we never had in baseball or never paid attention to before or in your face to make yourself look smarter. But you don't understand that a starting pitcher doesn't have anywhere near the same amount of value. And who's starting for you on a given day? has very little to do with your chances of winning that game or losing that game. This is the famous Budweiser beer. We know of no brand produced by any other brewer that costs so much to brew and age. Our exclusive feature with aging produces the taste, the smoothness, and drinkability you will find in no beer at any cost. So, as you got Game 7 coming up in the NBA Finals, we spoke a little bit about this last week. Uh, DeMar DeRozan, the former player for the T Toronto Raptors, not on the team that's still a game away from the championship. I'm sorry, uh, Game 6 of the NBA Finals will be in a couple days. Game 7 of the NHL Stanley Cup Finals will be tonight. So we'll have a new champion. It's going to be either St. Louis for the first time ever, or the Boston Bruins, a team that has won several Stanley Cups before. But... You know, as we were talking about last week, you, sometimes you make a move for a player, and that player is the one that puts you over the top. You think of the Mets with Ioannis Cespedes in 2015, and the difference that he made coming over July 31st, carrying the Mets in August and September, giving them a run to the playoffs, having them do the things that they ended up doing, in what was an exciting, exciting season for the New York Mets. But you look at the Houston Astros in 2017, a very controversial trade they ended up making for Justin Verlander, a guy who looked like he was on the decline of his career, looked like he kind of wasn't the same, and he went over to the Astros, he's got a new lease on life, led them to a World Series championship. You can talk about Kawhi Leonard and his impact on the Toronto Raptors and how much he's helped them. But you could also talk about DeMar Rose, DeRozan, who was the star there, and was one of the team leaders, and him leaving, all of a sudden, coinciding with the Toronto Raptors having a new lease on life and performing better. 
And I'll make a couple, a couple other examples that were pretty close to this. The Toronto, the, I'm sorry, the, you know, you talk about the Raptors making a trade, getting Kawhi Leonard, and dealing DeMar DeRozan, which could have been controversial at the time. And remember last week I was talking about how the key to Leonard may not have necessarily been his talent. Sure, what he's done in the playoffs, he's kind of showing that he's got a different level that he can take things to that maybe we didn't know before. But we knew if this guy was healthy, he was going to make a very positive impact on the Toronto Raptors. That was just a doubt. He wasn't playing last year for San Antonio. Maybe he didn't want to play for Greg Popovich. But the bottom line is he wasn't on the court. Because he wasn't on the court, that kept the San Antonio team down. But the 2004 Boston Red Sox at the trading deadline ended up dealing star shortstop Nomar Garcia Parra to the Chicago Cubs. And it was a controversial trade because this is a team that, yes, had Pedro Martinez, Manny Ramirez, David Ortiz, but really the player that held that team together, the elite number one star on that team, was not any of those other guys. It was Nomar Garcia Power. While the Red Sox were back and forth between getting into the playoffs, competing with the Yankees, kind of being in the mix year in and year out, Garcia Power was that glue piece, that guy that kind of kept that team together that lead player, that elite star, they had some other stars, but Garcia Parra was the man. They make the decision to trade him at the trading deadline to the Chicago Cubs in a three-way trade that ends up bringing them Orlando Cabrera and Doug Minkiewicz. So you look at what the results of that trade was. Nomar Garcia Parra, the elite star that he was. One of the best shortstops in Major League Baseball. The best player or the centripetal player that was on that Boston Red Sox team traded to the Chicago Cubs in a three-way trade. Orlando Cabrera, Doug Minkiewicz coming back. And I believe it was a four-team trade. And the Red Sox end up winning the World Series. The other example I'm going to make, Tiki Barber, Jeremy Shockey, playing for the Giants. Giants teams that just didn't seem to have that extra edge. Whether it was Tiki or Shockey taking shots at Eli Manning. Blaming the quarterback for being a reason the Giants weren't getting the job done. Well, all of a sudden, Tiki Barber decides to retire. Jeremy Shockey moves on, leaves as a free agent, and the Giants win the Super Bowl the first year that those two players aren't there. So now I'm kind of making my point a little bit. Is it more of Kawhi Leonard joining the Raptors and making them such a better team, or could it be more of DeMar DeRozan leaving that is helping that team get to a level they couldn't get to before. And I think of George Foster with the Mets in 1986, and I don't think George Foster was holding the Mets down, but Foster's release from the New York Mets on that 86 team allowed for Kevin Mitchell to get in the lineup more, allowed for the Mets to play Lenny Dykstra and Mookie Wilson at the same time. Something they weren't able to do before. Sometimes you take a star, a big player, and a player that you may think that you can't win without, and yet remove them from the team, it allows for the other players to click. And maybe DeMar DeRozan not being in Toronto with the Raptors anymore as much of an important player that he was for that franchise, and as much as he may deserve to have his number retired, as much as he deserves to maybe rank you know, amongst the best players to ever put on a Toronto Raptors uniform, the team may be better without him than they are with him. And like I said, there's the other side of it. You can talk about Leonard having an impact like a Cespedes with the Mets in 2015 or a Verlander with the Houston Astros in 2017. So it's either one or the other or maybe a combination of both. So if you happen to be in the Scranton, Pennsylvania area, there's a vision that began many years ago with a dream to bring the passion that was felt about the food to the people that we care about. Um, we fuse traditional Mexican ingredients with unique herbs and spices to create bold and unexpected flavors. Come experience the love of Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck. That's Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck located on Ney Avenue and Green Ridge Street in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the number is 
That's 570-800-8115. Two ways, one passion food truck. Once again, a, a traditional traditional Mexican, Mexican ingredients infused with unique herbs and spices to create bold and unexpected flavors. Two ways, one passion fruit, food truck. Nay Avenue and Green Ridge Street in Scranton, Pennsylvania. 510-800-8115. So I was thinking about another weird thing that just comes about. And every now and then, it, you know, you'll see something that happens. And I, I followed the kicking situation with the Chicago Bears. And, of course, we know about Cody Parkey missing that field goal that should have won the game against the Philadelphia Eagles in the playoffs. Ends up hitting two parts of the upright, the upright, the crossbar, and he's no longer the kicker. And we pretty much knew that the Chicago Bears were going to be looking for a new kicker in its offseason. And they end up auditioning a bunch of different kickers that came out in all wakes and facets of the sport and other sports. And there was a kicker, and I'm not joking about this if you haven't heard this already, with the name of Chris, or by the name of Chris Blewett. And I was thinking about names in sports that were just ridiculously ironic towards the position that you play. And if you're a kicker, the most important thing is, you know, probably not to have your name known. Because if your name know, is known throughout the sport of football, it's probably because, for lack of a better word, you blew it. Imagine being a kicker with the name of Chris, Blue, uh, Chris Blewett. And I was thinking of other names, Grant Balfour, uh, you know, Major League Baseball pitcher. You know, you spread his name out, you kind of say it a little slower. Ball four and a pitcher. Yeah, you see the irony in that. There's a racer by the name of Andy Freeze, or there was years ago. And you think of auto racing, you know, NASCAR, IndyCar, the circuit. And you think of Andy Freeze, which is something you need to make sure that you're Engine does what it's supposed to to have a name of Andy Freeze. It's it's pretty much ironic, but you know, unfortunately, this conversation only gets a little bit worse from here because then you start thinking of names that people happen to be given that have sexual innuendos to them, whether it's a Dick Trickle, you know, great race car driver passed away in recent years. And you, you get to throw different names out there and say, hey, there's no explanation needed. I don't have to explain exactly what these names could be constituted as. You know, in baseball, there's Dick Pole, Johnny Dickshot, um, other sports names like Steve Schartz, B.J. Cobbledick, and of course the legendary Dick Buckus in the National Football League. And they're all ironic names, and I don't really put a lot of stock in in some of the names that players create themselves. Like Ron Artest, yeah, he legally changed his name to Meta World Peace. And we can sit here and talk about how weird it is, but he chose to do that himself. The same rights that any American has to legally change their name to whatever they want. World Be Free, another former basketball player, did the same thing. You know, uh, you know Chris Jackson eventually became Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. Lou Alcindor became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Cassius Clay became Muhammad Ali. Those same rights that any American has to change their name legally, whether it's religiously based or it's just a decision that you want to make. I could change my name if I want to, my first name to John Pielli and my last name to .com if I wanted to. Now, I think it would be stupid. I wouldn't agree with it, but I could if I want to. So some of the names that you, you, you hear out there, yeah, they're weird names, but those are Americans and people that are exercising their rights to change their name to whatever it is that they want to. But the ironic ones, the, you know, looking at, at a, you know, a guy like a Chris Blewett and being a kicker in the National Football League, be a tough name to hold on to while you're out there kicking field goals. You know, Andy Freeze, that's a funny one. And you think about that as a you know NASCAR or any car driver. Grant, ball four. You know, you look at early win, who was a pitcher in Major League Baseball for many years. That's the kind of name you want. 
Doesn't that fire you up? The guy's a pitcher. He pitches nine innings every game. By the way, at a time in baseball where the starting pitchers went nine, he goes out there and his it says on his back back is his jersey win. That's what he's out there to do. And I'll close this topic by talking about a player by the name of Ben Gay, a soccer player, Ben Gay. Obviously, we think of Ben Gay, the you know the ointment, the cream. And then the last one, we looked up a mayor, a former mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana. And his name was none other than Harry Balls. His last name was spelled B-A-A-L-S. Just a reminder that Castro provides maximum protection against viscosity and thermal breakdown. This is the Pass Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com, St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Also, Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck located on Nay Avenue and Green Ridge Street in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, a little bit of a recap of the show. We spoke about the same issues that we were bringing up last week. Managers of Major League Baseball don't make the decisions that they used to. So when we're throwing blame out, we're showing our own ignorance, our own lack of being in touch with the changes of baseball. And you, you may be one of those people that throw stats out with the intention of trying to make the listener or the person on the other side sound stupid. But you also sound stupid when you blame the manager for every single decision that's made in a Major League Baseball game. Most of them are made for him. Most of the scenarios are set up, hey, if this happens, do this. Before the game, they're told what players to play, what players are getting a uh, you know a planned day off. These are the things that you see that happen all the time in baseball. And the other thing that we kind of look a little bit ignorant when we do is when we judge certain starting pitchers. So and so is on the mound today, so that means you got a good chance to win. But when so and so is also pitching, you may not have a good chance. The starting pitcher in Major League Baseball, the pitching matchup. When we try to when we set out our regular bets, like we're going to bet what the lines are the game, and obviously as it goes to Las Vegas, they're still kind of fixated on what the pitching matchup is, who's starting for one team against who's starting for the other team, being a big indication of who should be favored to win the game or lose the game. Yet starters aren't going very deep into the games. Teams are using openers. Teams are only using starters for one or two times through the batting order in certain situations. So can you say that a pitcher that isn't going to go a certain amount of time in, in a game, when that team is prepared and has their best relievers ready to go in innings five, six, seven, eight, and nine, are they definitely at a disadvantage? Even that elite pitcher might be going seven. And they have to have things clicking on all cylinders. Pitch count, well under 100 pitches. Everything being executed right to even go past the seventh inning now. Complete games in Major League Baseball. Come on. I don't have to talk about how few of them they are. Yet, we look at the pitching line, the pitching matchup on day in and day out, and we say, hey, game one of the Mets-Yankees doubleheader, well, the... Yankees have a better chance because Tanaka is pitching because he's better than Zach Wheeler. Yankees have a better chance in game two because James Paxton is a better pitcher than Jason Vargas. It's as much of a coin flip as it is over the two teams that are playing. And yet, we put a lot of emphasis on who's starting a given game for a Major League Baseball team. We also spoke about Kawhi Leonard and the trade for DeMar DeRozan. And different scenarios in sports history where uh, good players have been added to a team at the right time. You know, Cespedes with the Mets in 2015, Justin Verlander with the Houston Astros in 2017. And players that were stars or important or integral pieces of a team ended up leaving at just the opportune time. Nomar Garcia Parra with the Red Sox in 2004, the Giants in 2007. With Tiki Barber and Jeremy Shockey, George Foster with the Mets in 1986. So when it comes to the Leonard DeRozan trade, you have to ask yourself: Are the Raptors better because Leonard is just that much of a superior player? He is a Verlander. He is a Cespedes. Or is it because Demar DeRozan isn't there anymore, and it was a simple turning of the switch, moving on from one star player to another? 
Maybe it was the Garcia Parra leaving or the George Foster leaving or the Tiki Barber leaving that energized that team enough and put them in a position where they can win themselves an NBA championship. Last thing we talked about, you know, ironic names in sports. The one that stood out, Chris Blewett, the kicker who was just released by the Chicago Bears. Obviously, the irony that exists there. And you can talk about Andy Freeze, the racer, the race car driver, Grant Balfour, the pitcher in Major League Baseball. And obviously, the, one, the names with sexual innuendos that no need any description for. Johnny Dickshot, Dick Pole, Dick Trickle, Dick Buckkiss, B.J. Cobbledick. Steve Schartz, Ben Gay, and most importantly, the mayor, the former mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana, Harry Balls. And that's what we'll leave you on today. The Pass Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com, as well as Two Ways, One Passion, food truck located on May Street and Green Ridge Street in Scranton, Pennsylvania. The number there, once again, is 570-800-8115. 570-800-8115. We'll be back with you next week. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.